Classical history. It seems boring to most. But what if I told you it's the number one thing missing in our society? There's two concepts, a Roman one of virtus and a Greek one of arete. They mean excellence in all things and real masculine virtue. In today's episode, we're going to look at how we restore that and how we make history come alive. Today, we're going to fix society. All that and more. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the Jeremy Ryan Slate Show. I am your host, Jeremy Ryan Slate, the CEO and co-founder of Command Your Brand. We help our clients to combat cancel culture by getting them the right podcasts and new media. You can check us out over at commandyourbrand.com. Reminder, if you're brand new to this channel, like this video, leave us a comment and smash that subscribe button if you support liberty, freedom, and want to build a better future. And uh, guys, I'm very, very excited for today's guest. Um, Friend of the show, Dr. Jason Dean, who's been on the show, I think like five times at this point tagged me in a thread um, by a handle on X named um, um, at cost of glory there. I was trying to remember off the top of my head. And uh, it's actually today's guest. And it was about, you know, how law breaks down at the fall of a republic. It was a very, very well written thread. So if you're not following at cost of glory, go do that. Our guest today is Alex Pekus. Alex, thanks for hanging out with me today, man. Thanks, Jeremy. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's great to connect over the fall of the Republic, which is very much on my mind on on many levels these days. It feels very real now, man, which is the wild part. <laughs> and I, the thing I wanted to get into first and foremost, so if you want to tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do, and then also, you know, you were in academia, you're not in academia anymore. So, so tell us a little bit about, I guess, why that change happened as well. Yeah, so I did, uh, I studied classics in grad school. I went on and... Uh, Taught for a few years out in California, a couple of schools. I uh, had the fortune or misfortune of getting a tenure track job. And so I was kind of on the track to become like a lifer in academia. And I left in 2020 and started the, I was working in the private sector for a while and doing the, this on the side, I started this podcast called Cost of Glory, which is um and we'll talk about maybe down the line what what inspired me to do that sure. but so basically i'm uh, and I, i've just recently wrapped up my other engagements i'm going full time on this podcast <laughs> and i i left academia because so i was a classicist i studied the greeks and the romans and in particular the greeks but you know everybody has to do everything these days and so i I, f- I looked around, I had this experience when I was teaching in grad school that was maybe the first like red flag for me of something is wrong in academia. And there were many minor red flags. But so what, what I, was the red flag for you? Because I know for, for me, it, for me, it was an undergrad when um, my, my uh, undergrad degrees in, in Catholic theology. And they're like, so we're going to do a class called Catholic social teaching. And our first five <laughs> references are from Marxist philosophers. I'm like, wait, this isn't Catholic. What are we doing? So anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Something's rotten in the state of Denmark. Yeah, so 2015 fall, everybody maybe remembers the mood. Um, I was precepting. At Princeton, they called it precepting when you're a TA. And I was teaching this class in, in the evenings. And our classroom was near the president's office <laughs> in uh, Nassau Hall. and uh, this kid gets to my precept kind of late and he's like, did you hear what happened? There's storm in the president's office. And so basically there was some kind of campus activism about, you know, racial e- equity or something at Princeton. And I kind of pressed them on like, what are they actually protesting here? I mean, I think Princeton students probably have it pretty good and they're demanding all of these unreasonable things. And I thought, man, this is really stupid. And like, I thought, Princeton was better than this. But anyway, so I I kind of I kind of planted the seed and, and then in the in the spring I was precepting another class on the the problem of evil and we were reading Friedrich Nietzsche his uh, um genealogy of morals. And you know as a as a somebody's raised Christian and still practicing I had kind of been raised to think of Nietzsche as the bad guy. 
And yet, when we were reading the genealogy of morals, I like suddenly realized this is what these little twerps need to hear. Like this is, you know, a, a, a version of a vision of the classical world that fronts manliness and heroism and kind of explains why weakness is bad and leads to resentment. And I just, I felt like I saw all around me this kind of weakness converted into resentment in the Ivy League. And so that that was sort of like a turning point for me. And I felt like I, I had to, having read Nietzsche, really question a lot of my, my own approach to the ancient world. I started reading Homer really <laughs> almost religiously, kind of inspired by him in Greek. And it's kind of every morning I wake up and have this routine of reading the Iliad and spears going through eyeballs. And um, so I had this professor in undergrad that he would get up there and just randomly quote lines from the Iliad. And I'm like, how, how is he doing that? And like, he, he just like, he, he just get going sometimes and you just, you'd be like waiting for him to like mess up a line or forget it. And you're like, I, I don't know how he's memorized this, but anyway. <laughs> well, you read Plato and th there were dads that had their sons memorize the whole damn poem. Uh, and that's what so much of education used to be, you know, just assimilating these texts and, and drilling them in. And, you know, for, you know, American undergrads, so much of what they spend, they spend way more time reading critical literature and like developing some, you know, argument about the text and actually learning what it actually says. Uh, so, um, so when I was, so that was like a, a moment for me, and I realized there's this kind of like problem of campus activism and the way that the administration treated it was so uh, permissive and lame and just you know, mealy mouthed. But then when I when I was teaching as a as a as a lecturer out in California, I one day I was doing this lecture on Athenian democracy and the origins of Athenian democracy and you know, the story of Cleisthenes, you know, redistricting Athens, and I told the story of uh, the Pisistratids and this kind of weird attempt. Uh, basically they they assassinated um one of the one of the tyrants family it was this kind of gay lover coup anyway so i was i was like doing a lot of storytelling and kind of make it make it come alive for for the students and they they seemed to really be engaged and loved it and i i happened to invite on that day a fellow professor of mine who i liked and still respect but you know i asked her for feedback on my lecture and she said it was good the one thing that she gave me a feedback that that kind of stuck out to me was too much narrative that 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 I was indulging in too much storytelling that it was like too entertaining I should have spent more time with the material sources and the archaeology whereas you know I try to kind of tell this story of like Cleisthenes the hero and you know respect this you know ancient tradition of um of like high agency man doing something really impressive and I thought, wow, yeah, I, I get what she's what she means, and she's probably right. Yeah, too much narrative. But you know, those those kind of moments, and you you know, you you see a lot of these in your academic career. I just sort of think like there's something wrong with the way that we're we're presenting these texts. Like even in a classics department, especially in a classics department these days, the the great stories of Greco-Roman antiquity are are never told except kind of with a, with a caveat, like, don't, okay, we can, these are great stories, but let's just remember that if you get too excited about this, you're probably a fascist. Yeah. Well, and, I think that's the problem too. I was talking to my, my, uh, to, to Dr. Lake, who was my grad school advisor yesterday. And it's like him and I are actually working on a, a, a book on Rome together. So we're talking a lot more than, than we used to. And I guess it's interesting. Cause I feel like when we look at history now, like at least when I looked at history, I looked at it for what can I learn from it? And I feel like when history is told in the last 20 or 30 years, they look for it with an agenda of like, I want to connect his, this modern person to this historical figure. And they're trying to find these ways to connect it rather than like a narrative where you can learn something. It, it's, it's gotten really weird. Yeah. And it's yeah. very positivist. It's very presentist. Um, there's, there's a lot of reasons for this that go back to the 19th century and the, 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 the turn of history becoming, uh, a scientific discipline in the uh, concept of the uh, German ac Academy of the 19th century that, you know, so much of what history became ancient history was like myth busting and really a move away from 
this idea of great man history, which is just like, you know, a, a shorthand for saying illegitimate, you know, not serious history. And, you know, students, grad students, scholars are really you know, discouraged to write biographies. It's not serious. I was discouraged from doing that. Um, it's seen as popular and, and basically like the whole idea that history should inspire you is really problematic. It's like, this is like the word that always comes up. Oh, this is problematic. So I got, I got really frustrated with that and felt like this was kind of part of what was wrong, not just with the classics discipline, but like maybe something that was missing in Western culture in general that, you know, cause these, these really are the foundations of Western civilization. And that matters. That actually means something. And when you take them out, like, weird stuff starts happening. So, so I left in the middle of the pandemic in the middle of the zombie apocalypse and uh, tried to try to chart a different path. I think that's a, a good time to do it. And I think that the thing I really wanted to hit on, which kind of opens up the, the conversation that, that I want to have with you today, is you mentioned kind of how these historical figures of the past, they, they inspire greatness. And, you know, they, they really, they show us how we can take on difficult things. And there's, there's two concepts that I really like. One is from, from Greek and one is, one is uh, from Roman. And once again, I'll apologize for any of my mispronunciations. I always get all these comments and emails back from my audience about all of my terrible New Jersey pronunciations on things. But the, 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 the concept from, from Latin of virtus, which is this, this idea of excellence and courage and character and manliness. And you have from, from Greek, this concept called arete, which is this, you know, idea of excellence, the, the fullest realization of potential and, and really kind of getting to the best at what you can do. These are actually two things that are being hammered out of society now. And I think they're two really important concepts. So I guess when you look at that, how does, how does that fit into the narrative of, of what you're seeing? Yeah, well, so the Greeks and the Romans are, were a really important piece of the American founding. And this is, reflected in the lives of a guy like George Washington, who is modeling himself after Cincinnatus and Cato, the younger. Uh, Although George Washington Hamilton. did not want to be associated with the society of since of the, of Cincinnatus. Um, he had, he had uh, back and forth relationship with them, but anyway, continue. <laughs> yeah. It's always complicated. And, um, um, and, and he was not necessarily, a uh, an avid reader, but you know, he, he, he read enough to know what he liked and he, he liked uh, Cato. He liked um, Addison's Cato's famous play that he had staged at Valley Forge and, you know, Hamilton too, another very important figure in the American founding, very interested in Julius Caesar, but in all the state founders at you know, Valley Forge, again, that terrible winter in the, uh, Revolutionary War. He's staying up late in the night reading Plutarch's Lives, mm -hmm. uh, this classic text that we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about it at length because it's kind of what my podcast is based on. And so basically, you know, they're looking at these texts because they are, it's like common knowledge that if you want to be great, if you want to pursue a public life, that these texts are going to give you that. And the word for that, which they knew just matter of factly was virtue, virtus, the translation, virtue is a translation of this Latin term, virtus, which is a translation, not a translation, but like an equivalent of this Greek concept you brought up, arete, which is excellence. And they mean kind of the same thing in Greek and Latin, more or less. And, and basically both words are etymologically connected with the word for man. Vir in Latin, vir, virtus, arete, arain in Greek. And what you get from studying the lives of the great leaders of the past, especially the Greeks and Romans who kind of laid down the foundation, is this highest form of manliness, of mm -hmm. public manliness. Um, and it's something that you can get through reading a treatise on virtue, maybe like Plato's Republic, but above all, it's something you get kind of by osmosis, by, by, by being inspired by their stories, by listening to them, studying their lives, emulating them. Uh, and this is very much the classical understanding of like 
how you bec- become great. Cicero, this great Roman statesman, talks about the, the, the surest shortcut to greatness is to associate yourselves with the great. Whether you do that in person by finding them, making the, their company, or by studying them in books in the past. Preferably both, but if you can't have the one, you can at least everybody has access to to the other. And often the studying the great leaders of the past will introduce you into friendship with the great men of, of the present who are kind of men of common interests. So I think this is really key, actually, because as you know, we've talked about, we, we seem to be facing this crisis in masculinity. This is something very alive in the discourse today on the internet and elsewhere. And, and if you look at the way that culture is gone, the, the crisis in masculinity, this kind of plummet of masculinity is in a lot of ways, the same problem as this plummet in public virtue where we don't have leaders that we're satisfied with, Where's excellence gone? Where's virtue gone? Where's competence gone? It's gone the same direction as masculinity in general. And I think it's correlated, inextricably linked, that's my thesis at least, Mm -hmm. with the, the, the falling away in cultural consciousness of these great paradigms of excellence that we have from the Greeks and Romans. So that's where kind of where Plutarch comes in and what, what the mission of my podcast is. And perhaps we can unpack that at some point. Yeah, I want to get into that more in just a second. I think the thing that's really important about this, Alex, is is if you look at uh, when in in the wider society, you do have kind of this this cultural decay, and there's been this this overreaction of, of masculinity, if that makes sense, right? Like there's been this this kind of I think it's been more like on Instagram and things like that, but it's th- this idea of the guy is like, I'm a man, I got a beard, I swear at you, you know, like, and because of that, I'm masculine, and I, and I think. There's definitely this idea of, of reaching for something, but what they're actually missing is the component in the piece that you're talking about, right? This, this idea of, you know, what is virtue or what is masculinity really, or, you know, what is excellence? So I think there's a real desire for it in society, but it, it's, it's really missing. And I guess when we look at it, w- the biggest th- reaction I've got from people, and I'm sure you've, you've had similar things with your podcasts in, in talking about the Roman Empire is I'm finding people just don't know anything about it. You know, if they if they know something, they don't have the right information. And but most people know nothing at all. And I guess when we look at it like, why aren't we learning these things? Yeah, you know, the the version of masculinity you get from, you know, an Andrew Tate or any other number of influencers. It's, it, I, I really struggle with him because I like some of the things he <laughs> says, but I'm like, oh, man, I would not want my kids like learning how to live from him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like it's it's nice to have common enemies with somebody. Um, but you know, I, I think that so the, the Greeks and Romans are in these, generally speaking, hyper militarized societies. They're fighting wars. The Greeks, in particular, are interested in physical culture and in personal training and athletics. Um, the and so, but they, you know, they see all of the kind of memeable aspects of manliness. You know, taking baths in cold rivers and you know physical bravery it's all important but it's only just the baseline you know there's there's so many other aspects of manliness of of virtus and arete that that are are so important and you know the the classic formulation is justice prudence or um restraint sophrosune uh, bravery courage which is the foundation and then sophia wisdom uh, sapientia wisdom or cleverness. So like there, there's this kind of complex harmony of the virtues that you get most, uh, most clearly in Plato expressed in the, say the Republic, but, um, you know, it, it has to do with manliness is something that should properly understood, give you an advantage in negotiating diplomatic treaties Mm -hmm. in, persuading your wife to move to this neighborhood that you want her to move to as opposed to this one or this city. There, there, there's a whole range of persuasive skills that are fundamental to proper classical manhood that I think the, the manfluencers just aren't in touch for the most part with That's the a great tradition. Word, by the Some way. Of them. I've never heard that word <laughs> used before. I like that manfluencers. <laughs> there, you know, it, it it's, it's it, in a way, what people think of as the Western canon, 
uh, is kind of like a database of paradigms for proper masculinity. So like it, it's something that in the past we really took seriously as like maybe the most important thing to pass on to the next generation, like how to be a, a good man, nay, a great man. Um, it's not just about, um, you know, how much wealth you have or how strong you are, how many women you have or your status. It's, it's about this m- more complex concept of virtue, arete, which isn't like virtue in the sense of virtue signaling, right? I think we, we understand that. Yeah. It's, it's like being a full, the fullest version of yourself, um, which is something I, I really think we're in dire need of recovering today. It's interesting too. I don't know if you've heard the concept of like the sheepdogs of society. That, you know, mm-hmm. it's only a, a small percentage of, of like, you know, real, I guess, big, big beings or big people that you need to actually like shift the wheels of power and do things. And I, and I think that the interesting thing that not only are losing masculinity, we're also losing our sheepdogs in a way, right? The people that can, can kind of put society back together. And I think that to me, that's the bigger concern about all this, you know, whether it's, you know, okay, like, sure, you should be a great father and you should be better because of these things. But like at the same time, we're losing, we're losing the ability to put things back together when they fall apart. And now a word from our sponsors. The wellness company and their doctors are medical professionals you can trust. And their new medical emergency kits are the gold standard when it comes to keeping you safe and healthy. This medical emergency kit contains an assortment of life-saving medications, including ivermectin, z pack Rest assured, knowing that you have emergency antibiotics, antivirals, and antiparasitics on hand to help you and your family stay safe from whatever life throws at you next. So you can support the wellness company by heading over to twc.health slash JRS. That is twc.health slash JRS. Get up to 15% off select products, support the wellness company, and help support this show. Thanks again. Yeah, and this might be a good segue uh, to Plutarch. So uh, Nietzsche has this quote. I think he's kind of talking about sheepdogs here, actually, um, in this text about the uses and abuses of history. He's sort of criticizing the historical discipline of his day, the late 19th century. So already he's kind of seeing this trend that we see just like running rampant today of, you know, not really looking at history as a source of inspiration, but maybe looking at it to kind of break down institutions to find faults or kind of petty antiquarianism. But what he thinks, re- like the sheepdogs of society, like the people who want to lead and shape and create a, a new nation need is this other kind of history, which is monumental history, which is what he associates most, especially with, with Plutarch. And so he says to the young men of his day, satisfy your souls on Plutarch. A hundred such men educated and matured and who have accustomed themselves to the heroic. He says, um, Believe, learn to believe in yourselves when you believe in his heroes. A hundred such men educated against the fashion of the modern times could silence now and forever the whole noisy pseudo education of our era. And, and so for, for a guy like Nietzsche, the, the, the antidote, I think the thing that people who are high agency or who aspire to be high agency need is that, that shot of greatness that you get from deep immersion in the historical paradigms, especially of the Greeks and the Romans. And I guess when we look at, I have to ask you too, because I'm trying to figure this out. So it's kind of, because the focus is on you, is that Pompey over your your left shoulder? And then who is that over <laughs> your right shoulder back there? So I've got Julius Caesar on one side okay. and then a, a bust that is sometimes called the bust of Sulla. Okay, and other it's times the bust called of Sulla. I couldn't of quite tell because it's so Africanus. far away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I guess when we, when we look at look at Plutarch then, I, I, the value in Plutarch's lives. So what are, what are Plutarch's lives? What is the value on them? Why have you chosen to concentrate on that, I guess, versus doing like, hey, let's do Suetonius's 12 Caesars. You know, like why, why did you choose to go that way? And I guess what's the value to, to, to the end listener in that? Yeah, I, you know, I looked around and I saw a, a growing interest in stoicism, which I think is a, a generally a positive development, but um, like an, an interest in ancient philosophy, I think kind of filling this void that this, especially men feel 
of uh, of like good advice in the in the public sphere. But so Plutarch is a philosopher. Also, he is he wrote a book called The Parallel Lives. Wrote many other books, but this is like his masterwork. Forty eight biographies of twenty four Greeks, twenty four Romans. And he kind of wrote this biography. Each one are, you know, 30 to 60 pages. So they're, they're bite-sized. And it became this incredibly influential book in the course of Western history, especially after it was rediscovered in the Renaissance. You know, it's like the parallel lives of Plutarch is the, the second most likely book to be on your shelf if you have any books. If you're an 18th century American, it's like right after the Bible. Plutarch's lives, you know, Machiavelli pours over it carefully. So, so what it basically is, is a collection of biographies written by a philosopher with a, let's call it a moral purpose. Like he wants to, he sees biography as a kind of training ground for virtue. And he, and he, and he profiles all of these great men like Julius Caesar, like Alexander the Great, like Sertorius, Sulla, Pompey, and Pericles, et cetera, et cetera. Not with the idea of holding them up on uh, an unblemished pedestal like they're saints, but to really dive into their characters and to understand their strengths and weaknesses and their virtues and their vices so that his readers can bring out virtue within themselves and refine the vices away from their character. But the way that he does that is through extremely talented, entertaining storytelling. He has this dramatic eye for great moments, great quotes, um, scenes, and all the emotional uh, dynamics of a situation. He also has... Um, he also will kind of dispense with a lot of the details that you normally associate with longer histories. And, and he says this explicitly in his biography of Alexander. I didn't sit down to write history. And so I'm not going to recount all of the deeds that Alexander did and all of his wars for, in fact, a casual castaway phrase said among friends or when he's a drink might reveal more about the character, the ethos of the man, sure. Then you know, a hundred great battles, and I think he's really right. And that's um, that's so that like that's what the purpose of reading it is. And the whole idea is you kind of kind of like Cicero said, you you get greatness first first and foremost by osmosis. And he wanted to give you like a database for doing that. I think the thing that's interesting, and this goes back to something you're talking about earlier, is. To me, it's it's funny. I, I, uh, to go, I'm going back to a conversation I had with my pro, uh, former professor yesterday. I think if you look at the history, I remember. I remember it because I learned the narrative. I learned the dates and things like that later on. Right? I learned, learned how to go back and put them in and make them make sense. And I feel like if you can make a great narrative, you can really make it interesting and bring it alive to people. And I think almost getting too much into the detail and getting too much into the specifics of it makes people not want to learn it, right? Because it becomes this big, unconfrontable thing. And I think you're taking away the value from people, right? If you get so into like, okay, we need to know all the minutiae and everything about it. And I think to me, that's been the the biggest the biggest learning point in talking to people about the Roman Empire is because, I, you know, listen, I'm, I'm your everyday person that knows history. I'm not as smart as, you know, as you or, or you know, other people that have a PhD. I only got my MA and that's, that's as far as I went. But I feel like if you can take it and you can make it real to people, like you can just open the world up to them. And I feel like we're, we're not, we're not allowing that. I think that's a big problem right now. Yeah. And so on, on the show, I basically am retelling Plutarch's lives. I'm, I'm going through the biographies one by one and doing deep dives on these guys, but trying to kind of stay loyal to Plutarch's, A, his moral intention of like, hey, let's assess their character. Let's see what their strengths and weakness are. But also start, sort, sort of stay loyal to his scope and not go too long, which is often challenging because I find these guys so fascinating. But you know, it's one of my criticisms for all that I respect a guy like Ron Chernow you know, his biographies are like 1,200 pages long. They're doorstoppers. I mean, who who gets through well, that? You and who I were talking about Adrian Goldworthy. Like, I love his yeah. books, but like, he's so superfluous. You're like, do I really need to know all that? <laughs> right. And 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 Plutarch is is 
um, is really great for his restraint there. Like he's he's got a lot more material at his disposal, but he sees his job as a biographer is filtering out, trying to focus on just the essentials. So I try to do that while giving you enough context that you can kind of listen to the story. But you know, on this thing that you were talking about, the um, you know storytelling versus uh, kind of longer form history. Um, Ralph Waldo Emerson was a total Plutarch nut and he actually kind of modeled his career after Plutarch. My, my daughter's named Emerson, by the way, we're, 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 we're related to the, the Emerson family on my mom's side. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. yeah, no, I love, I love Emerson. He's, he's fantastic. And, and he, he talks about, he has this whole essay on Plutarch and he talks about how awesome Plutarch is, all the reasons. And, and one of the reasons he gives is because Plutarch is the, basically in his view, the best starting point for getting into the great stories and the great events and the great men of antiquity. Because if you, if you actually plot it out, if you look at the dates that all of the men that Plutarch cataloged lived. So Plutarch's writing in the late first, early second century AD. um, But, but he basically goes up until the battle of Actium, which is the victory of Augustus over Antony, um, the kind of foundation of the Roman empire. So if you look at all the dates, they they form a pretty seamless line all the way from before the Persian Wars, from the foundation of the Athenian state and the Spartan state and the Roman state, all the way down Persian Wars, Peloponnesian Wars between Sparta and Athens, the conquests of Alexander, the rise of Rome, the, the, the Punic Wars with the Carthaginians, Rome and the conquest of Greece, and then finally the fall uh, and decline of the Republic. It, it's it's almost like this grand narrative of the most interesting, I would say, in the most heroic period of antiquity. And em- Emerson says, yes, there might be greater historians. Thucydides, sure, is a greater historian than Plutarch. But for every one reader that Thucydides has, he has, this is in Emerson's day in the 19th century, he has a hundred, Plutarch has a hundred readers. And probably that one reader, chances are, that Thucydides has, he owes to Plutarch. Somebody read Plutarch and then wanted to go deeper into the Peloponnesian War. And so they they went into Thucydides. So I think, you know, to really, especially to like capture people's imagination. And, you know, if you're like trying to embark on a self-improvement project, you everybody's talking about Greece and Rome. Uh, how, where do I start? Plutarch is, I think, the best place to start. And so I'm trying to make him more accessible in audio form. Although, you know, if you've got patience, you can just pick it up and start, start cr- cr- cranking through it and looking up the references. So, so let me ask you this, because um, I think to me, um, you know, it's it's been so long since I was in school. So I was like rereading Plutarch recently, and I just I just finished the uh, the Adrian Gold- Goldworthy uh, version of uh, of Julius Caesar, and I'm actually reading his his Fall of the Empire book right now. And I guess when you look at it, what Greek and Roman figures do you feel like are in hindsight totally misunderstood? Like I feel like when I look at Caesar, for example. I feel like what we're told about Caesar and what actually happened are two very different things, right? Like, you know, the, if you kind of look at you, you had mentioned to me before that you feel like Caesar would be like a a modern tech CEO. Now, you know, he wouldn't be this, Mm -hmm. you know, people see him as this kind of maniacal dictatorous, you know, murderous guy, which sure he probably killed a lot of people when he was in Gaul, but he was to me just really a, a man of his era, right? Like somebody that, was just kind of the best at playing the game that they were all playing at that time. And I guess when you look at it, what people do you think we misunderstand in future tense? And I guess, why would that be? Yeah, Caesar's a good example, uh, since we already talked about him a little bit. Um, one one figure that I think is really fascinating that you and I might disagree on still is uh, is this the one of the greatest Roman dictators, uh, Lucius Cornelius Sulla, yeah. who is Elon, Elon Musk's favorite dictator oh, i still think and, he's an evil bastard man those proscriptions <laughs> that you know he, he inspired cicero to some some terrible things <laughs> yeah fair but you know i think when i and i was really inclined so so i began the cost of glory and i'll, I'll do a quick detour before we get to Sulla. so one of the men that really inspired me to start the cost of glory podcasts three years ago is this figure sertorius so when i was I knew that I was leaving academia and then go, trying to go into the business world. And so I started actually kind of, you know, my own way, like Hamilton, just like late in the night, I'd be reading Plutarch's lives and try to prepare myself for what was coming. 
um, cause it was kind of in my wheelhouse. And I, I was, I was like, I should read all of these. Um, Oh, here's Sertorius. I have, I even heard of this guy. I don't know who this guy is, but you know, I'm trying to make through, make through all these lives. And so I, I crack it open and I, within a few pages, I have this realization like, Oh my God, if this is one of Plutarch's most obscure heroes, like what are the rest? Like this guy is incredible. He is the greatest Roman rebel. And he, so there's this civil war between Gaius Marius and, and Sulla and Sertorius is on the losing side of that war. And he, he flees to Spain and he basically holds out and forms like a rival state against Sulla for 10 years. He holds out against army after army that gets sent to him. And he spanks Pompey, young Pompey, who's just trying to, um, and he, he only, he only falls because he gets betrayed by one of his officers. So Sertorius is the guy I actually started the podcast with incredible guy. But so I was primed when I came to Sulla story to, to see him as the bad guy. And indeed he did some really terrible things, but you know, I think Sulla is, is, is a figure that I think he had a genuine, so, so there's a, a civil well, war. He has between, a charisma about him. And I think that's the thing. That, that's the thing that I, I really, I listened to the, it was like a three or four episode series that, that you did on him. And you really mm-hmm. do get like, you know, he's this carousing, drinking actor with a lot of charisma that somehow walks his way into to being this great military leader. Yeah, he he starts off as a kind of good for nothing playboy. He doesn't have enough money to succeed in Roman politics, but he kind of comes into some money in his late 20s. And he's like, ah, let's give this politics thing a shot. <laughs> and he ends up being incredibly good at it. And and he apparently just didn't have a lot of military experience either. And he becomes one of Rome's greatest generals. I mean, in, like incredibly effective general. And he he's... He's associated with the conservative, the optimate faction in Rome. He's from this great kind of fallen on down times, uh, noble family, the Cornelii. And his opponent, Gaius Marius, is like the populace, the man of the people, the soldier's soldier. Um, and that was the side Sertorius was on and later, later Caesar. But so, so Marius and Sulla, you know, listen to the episode if you want to get the full story. They end up having this falling out and fighting this civil war and Sulla ends up winning. And he he ends up going on this bloody proscriptions um, kick. So, you know, he basically it's a political purge and he he puts up names of all of his enemies in the forum. And if your name is on that list, you know, you've got a bounty on your head and your property is confiscated by the state. So he just like cuts the head off of all of the populares and many go into to hiding. And I think. You know, if you just look at the proscriptions, it's horrific. And and it did set a precedent that Julius Caesar, well, that Cicero maybe uh, in, in your in your telling kind of followed when he executed the Catalinarian conspirators 15 years later. But also Caesar did the unsullied thing. He 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 fronted when he was in this in his civil war. It ends Pompey. up being the thing that bites him in the ass to actually forgive yeah. the forgive the guys that could kill him and later do. Right. Caesar's like, no, we're not going to do proscriptions. No, I'm a new kind of dictator. Um, so he's this really important example in Roman history. But, you know, I think when I was when I was doing the life of Sulla, I think the thing that really stood out to me the most is how incredibly daring and competent he was when he was fighting. So he he and Marius have this like kind of mini war. And then he he goes off to fight Rome's enemies in the east, Mithridates in Greece. And he ends up really against all odds, lose, uh, winning this war against, you know, vastly superior armies. And he's been declared a public enemy by the Senate, which is kind of controlled by Marius. And so he has no supplies or reinforcements coming and he manages to scrape it together. And he also has this, I think he does have this sense of justice that, that there is, you know, um, it's a kind of eye for an eye sort of justice, which is the old Roman kind of justice yes. for sure. And he he sacks Athens and he's just brutal. He, he tells his, his soldiers that, you know, Athens rebels. They, they side with Mithridates and he tells his soldiers as they finally capture the walls of the city. He's like, spare the buildings and nothing else. <laughs> and it's just, you know, Plutarch tells memories, living memories of like blood running through the Dipolon gate. I mean, just rivers of blood. And it's just it's horrific. But 
you know, he was, that's how the Romans used to deal with rebellious allies. Yes. You know, you, you, you have a chance where surrender well, you even or look else. At how they treated Carthage, right? Like they didn't even want anything to grow mm-hmm. in the ground after they were done with it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think he, he's, he's, he's an inspiring figure for all uh, of, of his faults. And I think that, you know, Plutarch rightly condemns a lot of what he did in his later life um, after the proscriptions. And, you know, there is a case to be made that what Sulla's real weakness was, was when he finally wrote, you know, when he finally won the civil war and started these political purges, he kind of, he kind of lost control of it. Cause like a lot of his flunkies and, and minions are, presenting him with new names. Oh, Sulla, don't you remember this other guy? He's your enemy. Or they're, or they're bringing right? heads of people that weren't on the list and being like, this is the guy, right? You remember him. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, yeah, 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 whatever. And, uh, you know, he's, he's kind of trying to celebrate his victory. He's like 60. He's getting drunk and partying. And in a way it, it kind of gets, gets out of his hands. And I think that that goes to show that when you, when you finally win often, that's, that's when you're most liable to, to do something terrible. <laughs> and, and, let things get out of control and you have to basically you know he ruined his legacy if he had, if he had shown more restraint after the civil war and like not had all these abuses you know he actually laid down a pretty stable constitution um and it, you know he did kind of quell a lot of the dissent in the state for for several decades it it, it kind of worked you got to be honest and then when he did well, he also notices a lot of things too. Like when when he when you look at his his reforms, like he notices that a lot of the problems come from the tribunates. So he changes, mm-hmm. you know, the career. Like he changes the there, there's the the path of office in Rome is called the courses of norm, right? It's it's this path of offices you go through. So he makes the tribunate kind of a dead end because he realizes, well, that's where all the problems come from. So he gets yep. he's very smart and tactical where he sees the problems of Rome coming from. Yeah. And in his, is his view, the tribunes had sort of started the civil war by kind of tampering with the constitution, trying to strip him of his command, which was quasi legal, but quasi illegal. Um, and so he's like, well, all right, tribunes from, from now on are not going to be able to run for any further offices. And that strips the tribunate of his talent pool. Um, and he, he strips them of the power to call assemblies, So, you know, it it really worked. Unfortunately, you know, within less than a decade after he died, Pompey and Crassus, two of his protégés, restore the tribunate. And, uh, you know, the wild game starts back up again. But, you know, I think it's it's really noteworthy. He did lay down power voluntarily after he rewrote the laws. You know, he, he was given this office of dictator for life, but then he laid it down after, you know, a year and a half or two. Um, And... You know, the 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 Roman historian Momsen, this Nobel Prize laureate, kind of amazingly compares him to George Washington. You know, I, oh. I'd never heard Sulla and George Washington. Yeah, compared, I don't see the com- but, you know, I the can see the they, Cincinnatus comparison. I don't quite see Sulla. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, in the sense that they voluntarily laid down power when they didn't have to. It, it, it was a noteworthy example, I think. So I think he's misunderstood. I think he's worth a listen. At least uh, you might still think he's bad. But there's some there's some this is a thing of Plutarch. Plutarch is such he's so committed to his literary art and to his mission of, you know, telling you warts and all, but like the good and the bad that he manages to tell a great story about Sulla that you can still like him, even though Plutarch kind of finds him detestable in a lot of ways. So, you know, it's it's worth hearing the story of somebody who's maybe admirable, but deeply flawed anyway, because it can help us bring out virtue in ourselves. Well, I just, uh, by the way, I just started your, your series on Pompey. So, uh, I'm on, I'm on the, I'm on the kid butcher episode, which is the, the first of the series, but I guess looking at it then, Alex, like to me, I think the thing that's really interesting is it almost feels like in modern society, there's not a space for men like this, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Like, you, do you know what I mean? Like I, 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 to me, and you had mentioned this, um, I don't, you didn't mention this episode, but you mentioned it to me off, off camera, that a lot of these guys would be like modern CEOs or modern tech CEOs. And I think it's, it's frowned upon and there's not really a space for men like this in society anymore. Do you, do you feel that way as well? Yeah, I was recently had on my show, the um, president of the intercollegiate studies Institute, Johnny Burtka. And, you know, they do a lot of um, education on college campuses, ambitious people looking to go into politics. And I asked him kind of the same question, like, 
where do people go if they want to build you know, a public career to get the skills, the connections, and kind of express this desire for high agency, high ambition, shaping the world. And, you know, in the past, I think, you know, in the 18th, 19th century, maybe it was law, maybe it was the military. But, you know, the military is just so hopelessly bureaucratic now to say nothing of whether you what you think of a America's constant foreign wars. Yeah. And, and even the and, political sphere is kind of like just a, a do nothing swamp, right? Like you're, you're like, nobody's really going to stand out and do anything great. Yeah. And, you know, I, I really think that, you know, the world of business and entrepreneurship, especially tech for really, really ambitious people who want to just impact the world, it draws that his, that, that heroic thirsting individual in a much stronger way. Like, like Steve jobs, you know, he was a nice guy, but like he, it was because he wasn't really a nice guy. Like he yeah. was kind of out for glory in a lot of ways. There, there's you know, a he story wants to about make... Steve Jobs um, when they first came out with the mouse. I don't know. Have you heard the story where he wanted it to so. look a certain way? And they're like, Steve, we can't physically make it work and look that way. So he's like, I'm locking the door. You knock on it. And when you're done and you've made it look that way, I'll let you out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Caesar in a in a, in a turtleneck. And, you know, it's, uh, I, I had another conversation with, um, a friend of mine, Jonathan B, uh, who is, comes from that startup world, uh, tech startups, but he's now doing this project on, um, the classics of the Western canon. And we talked a lot about heroes. We talked about this text that Rousseau wrote about heroism and, you know, for Rousseau, um, who was very influential on the American founders, French Revolution, et cetera, et cetera. For Rousseau, and he was a Plutarch nut too. I mean, a super Plutarch nut, by the way. So check out that episode. But for Rousseau, the hero of the Plutarchan molds, of the present mold, distinguishes himself by this thing he calls strength of soul, <laughs> which is, it's not virtue. It's, it's this determination to see your will affected. It's not even the same thing as Nietzsche's will to power. But then the hero can be a kind of deeply problematic figure. They're kind of out for their own glory, but they understand that the way to eternal glory is benefiting the community. And you need heroes like that who are not like what Rousseau calls the citizen. Citizens need virtue. Heroes need strength of soul. But citizens need heroes to inspire them to virtue. Uh, and, and there's a kind of, I think, I think it's very, it's a very nuanced picture. And, you know, in a lot of ways, I think that tech founders are, are like that. Like if you look like, what are what do all the young people want to be today? The young men, at least, you know, a lot of them want to be tech founders. Some of them want to be, uh, I think a lot of them want to sit on their couch and watch YouTube, but I, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I think you got to look for where the high agency people are going. Sure. And it would, but this is a real problem. This is a huge problem for the state. You know, why is it that, that the political life doesn't attract those kind of people? It needs to, if we're going to have a healthy state. And I think part of the problem is we have stripped the educational formation of our future leaders of the good stuff, which is the heroic men of Greek Greco Roman antiquity. And, you know, there's a whole tradition that, that builds off of this, like statesmanship is founded on what the Greeks would call moral philosophy, which is fortifying yourself with examples, critically analyzing virtue and vice, how these great men succeeded. Um, and you know, understanding the whole of human nature, there's an educate. And now it's like this kind of McKinsey managerial, uh, you know, yeah presentations and spreadsheets that like that's what's seen as like the foundation of competence and you need experience you need to like know how to work a spreadsheet for sure but that's not that's not going to get you these great high agency lead these like lee kuan yu kind of leaders um for the future and i think it's the biggest thing missing in our society i think if we fix this we fix so many of our problems because i think it, it gets back to you know, we need leaders like this. We need people that take responsibility. We need people that take risks and, and you know, are okay with, you know, you could, you know, 
it's they talk about Caesar crossing the Rubicon saying the die is cast because he was taking the biggest risk that could ever happen for him. He could win it all or he could lose it all. And we don't have enough people like that society nowadays. And I, and I think it's the thing that's missing. And I think the way we get it back is a lot of the work that you're doing out there with your with your podcast, which is Cost of Glory, and a lot of what you're doing also on X as well. So, so you know, where can people follow you, Alex? And where can people get connected to your work, man? Yeah, thank you. Uh, costofglory.com is my website. Uh, Cost of Glory is available on all podcast players, Spotify, Apple, all the others. I'm also on YouTube. Uh, if you if you like to listen in that form, uh, it's all audio mostly right now, though that might change in the near future. But uh, and, and at Cost of Glory on X, and I I try to post regularly. But um, yeah, there's any just Google Cost of Glory, and you're you're likely to run into me. Very cool. Alex Petkus, thank you so much for, for hanging out with me today. And, and everybody, you definitely have to check out his podcast. He has an excellent podcast voice, which I think is very important for, for history podcasts. <laughs> Those of my my listeners out there that might, like myself, love, love Dan Carlin's show. Like You have to have a good podcast voice for, for history. So Alex, thanks for hanging out with me today, man. Very kind. Thanks a lot, Jeremy. Great to talk. Absolutely. And guys, if you're brand new to this channel, a reminder to like this video, leave us a comment and smash the subscribe button if you support liberty, freedom, and want to build a better future. I will catch you guys next time. Smash it. <laughs>